Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Brenda. And uh, I was taught to introduce myself that way because I have to be reminded on a regular basis that the most important thing about me is that I'm an alcoholic. And uh, it's not for you to know that. It's for me to know that because the minute I forget that, I put myself in danger. I really do. Um, when I first um, – I remember when I had my first drink. You know, my parents were – my dad was military, so we traveled a lot. And I was always the new kid in town. And um, I always felt out of place. I never felt like I belonged because everybody had friendships that they'd made in high in grammar school and all this, and I didn't. You know, I came in, and I always was the oddball, and um, I never felt like I belonged until I was 16 when I had my first drink, and then I belonged because when I had that drink, all my problems were solved. Alcohol was my solution. It took care of my shyness. It took care of my not having any close friends. It took, because I mean, I could meet anybody then and open up and talk. So um, I was always a year ahead, I mean, a year behind everybody else in my class because being military, the military kept us a little bit ahead. So when we got back to the States from overseas and I had to go back into the public school system, I had to take a test to go back in and they put me ahead a year. And I'd started school a little bit early anyway, so it was almost two years difference between me and my classmates. And they got to do all this stuff that I wasn't allowed to do. So at 16, I was a senior getting ready to graduate, and I had my first drink, and it worked. So then I could catch up with my classmates on everything. I still couldn't go do a lot of things they did because my parents still had restrictions on me. They didn't drink, and I didn't understand why they made such a big deal out of it after I had that first drink because it worked. And um, so I graduated at 16. I found out when I went on senior girls' night out and a lot of us were sitting around drinking, I found out some of the things that they'd been doing, and I was jealous because I hadn't been able to do that stuff. So I spent the next two months trying to lose my virginity. I spent the next two months trying to catch up with all their experiences, and I wanted it all, and I wanted it now. So I started into college that summer. Spent my first day in college. Um, A boy from home came up. We got a 12-pack and went out, and uh, we had a car wreck. So I was late getting back to the dorm. First thing they did was call my dad. And that's the first time my dad even had any indication that I drank. And it just so happened that the uh, dean of women at my college had also been my high school algebra teacher. So she knew me. And uh, she told my dad a lot of stuff, (laughs) a lot of stuff. Well, I had to uh, stay at the college. He wouldn't let me quit. I wanted to quit. And I had to stay because he said, no, you started this, you're going to finish it. And I couldn't go out. I was campus. And being campus meant that when I got out of my classes, I went straight to my dorm and I stayed there. I couldn't go out or anything. So I did that. And the minute they let me off restriction, I got in trouble again. Same way, alcohol. And I got campus again. And I wound up flunking out because uh, it was more fun for me to party than it was to go to class. I would go party at night and then I wouldn't make it to class at all. And I thought, well, you know, I'll do I'll catch up. I'll catch up. But I never caught up. And that was a pattern that followed me for the next 33 years. I sat on the bar stool for many, many years, and I kept saying what I was going to do, what I was going to do. And I never did it. I thought I was going to be all these amazing things. And next thing I knew, I was 49 and a half years old, and all I did was sit on the bar stool. Um, I found out later on that uh, what I needed to do was get married. If I got married, my problems would be over. So I found a guy to marry me, and he was 24, and I was 17. So we got married, and first thing I did was get pregnant. Well, I got pregnant before we got married, but that's beside the point. You know, I think that's a – I did find a way to lose the virginity. Um, so <laughs> the biggest thing that I found out was that I married this 24-year-old, and after we got married, he wasn't even more ready for marriage than I was. I couldn't drink because I was pregnant, and he's out drinking every night. He'd lost his drinking buddy, and so I left when I was eight months pregnant, and I moved back with my parents. And being an only child, I pretty much got my way. And um, as soon as I had the baby, 
I filed for divorce, divorced him on a Friday, got married again the next Tuesday to a guy that was 24 that I'd gone to high, that I'd known through high school. He was ahead of me in school. Uh, so here I was with a baby, second marriage, 18 years old, just, just about to turn 19. And that one, he just said some things I didn't like. So I was going to do what my first husband did. No man was going to do me the way that that man did ever again. I was never going to be hurt again. So uh, I started going out drinking and finding other people to talk to. And he didn't like it. So we went up getting a divorce. I think we were married like four months, four months. And as soon as we got divorced, within a week, I was married again for the third time. So here I am, just turned 19, on my third marriage, one child, and then I wound up expecting my third child, my second child. And uh, my third husband was 24. And I'm catching up to these guys, right? I'm catching up. Uh, and I did the same way with him. After the baby was born, I started running around. Now, I stayed married to him for a while. I didn't live with him. I left him. But I stayed married to him. And I'm doing all these things that I want to do. I've got two small children. And I was introduced to other substances other than alcohol. Because, see, every time I'd take a drink, I could get brave and go do these things I wanted to do. And I'm not going to tell you alcohol made me do those things. I did them because I wanted to. It's the defect of my character. It's what I was born with. And any time somebody hurt me, I would go out of my way to get back. Revenge. Revenge is a great motivator for me. And um, what I did do was take off and leave him with two small children. And then every time I'd get in trouble, I'd run back to him, and he would take me back in time for me to run off again. And I did this for quite a few years. And I wound up with these other substances I found uh, getting in a lot of trouble, and legal trouble. I finally started having some legal problems out of all this stuff. And uh, the judge would see me every week. I would go out on Friday night. I was a waitress, so I always had money in my pocket. Because the alcohol chose the job I did, too. I started out as a bookkeeper. And I failed at that because I couldn't get to work on time. But without, you know, with waitressing, I could go in at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, make all my money, have a pocket full, go out and drink all night. Then I could sleep in the next day. So this is what I did. And everybody else that I worked with kept the same kind of schedule I did, so we were good. We were good to go. And I was having a blast, I thought. A lot of times I'd say, well, what happened last night? And they'd tell me, I'd say, oh, yeah, that was fun. Yeah, that was a blast, you know. So uh, anyway, what I would do is I would take off with these friends, and I was, I was doing all this stuff, and he, he is trying to raise two kids. And then I got into trouble legally. Every Friday night I would go out with enough money in my pocket to pay the bond because I knew I'd be in jail. I knew I'd be in jail for a night out. Somebody's going to say something wrong to me, and what I found out was that if you're drinking and you want to stay awake, the best way to do that is to get the adrenaline flowing. And the best way to get the adrenaline flowing is to start a fight. So I, I didn't fight with women. I fought with guys. And I always picked guys that wouldn't hit a woman. <laughs> At least I was smart that way. But I would hit them. And then, of course, the adrenaline would be flowing, and I could drink some more. And by God, look how wrong they are. Look how wrong they are. And uh, I'd usually wind up getting arrested. And uh, I, even, I even hit a cop one time and got arrested. But I wasn't aiming at him. I was aiming at somebody else, and he forgave me. So, uh, you know, I was at that age, too, that, you know, I looked pretty good back then. I was in my, you know, early 20s and uh, middle 20s, and I'd always dress up and show up in court nicely when I had to go to court. So I didn't just pay the fine and forget it. But I was there every week, every single week. And finally, at the end of it, I started doing worse stuff. And some of the stuff I did got me some time. And uh, these things I did, I had, I wound up going to Georgia Women's Correctional Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, right, uh, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, but I got arrested in Atlanta. And uh, so when I was doing my time there, I thought, I'm never going to do this again. I am done. I'm not going to do any of this stuff. I'm not going to drink. I'm going to church while I was in prison. I'm doing all this stuff because I'm not going to do that again. I want you to know my story is I don't advise it. I got out at 9 o'clock in the morning. A friend picked me up with a 12-pack. I was drunk by noon, and I had a needle in my arm by 6. So all those things that I was not going to do went right out the window, and I did not understand why. 
I came around the next day going, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I didn't know. And then I figured, it's the drugs. It's the drugs. I'll quit the drugs. So I managed to do that. I don't know how I did that, but I did manage to do that. And by this time, when I went to prison, my parents came down and took my children. I lost my girls. Uh, I say I lost them. I really gave them away because if I, I didn't just misplace them and not find them, they were taken from me. And I sat on that bar stool. I sat on that bar stool for another 20 years saying, I'm going to go get them back. I'll show them. I will show my parents they can't take my girls. And I didn't do it. Talked a good game, but never could follow through on any action. So uh, when uh, that was going on, I decided to quit the drugs because then I wouldn't go to prison and everything would be okay. Because see, what happened was when I quit that, my drinking tripled. And I was already drinking a lot, you know, and uh, I didn't see it as a problem. I did not know alcohol was a problem. I really did not know. And what I found out later on when I got to, well, I divorced the third husband finally, and I married the fourth husband. He was 24 and I was 34. Um, see, I'm, I'm stuck on this mindset, see, because, see, when I had my first drink, I quit maturing. When I had my first drink, I quit seeking any kind of ability to live. When I had that first drink, alcohol became my solution, and I didn't learn anything. And, of course, I kept being attracted to the same people, which is 24-year-olds. So this one I was with for about five years. Did the same thing to him I did the first three times. Never did I assume that I was a problem. Uh, I divorced him, remarried at the age of 44, to another 24-year-old. And uh, this one, actually, I mean, yeah, he was a good-looking guy. He was smart. He was talented. He worked. You yeah, know, it was all good, right? No, because, see, by that time, my alcoholism had gotten to such a point that I don't know how he ever put up with me. I really don't. I can stand here today and tell you that I was the problem. See, there's one denomination in every one of my five marriages that caused the problem. And the only thing in every one of my five marriages was me. I didn't see that when I was living it. But what happened was I kept doing the same thing over and over, and I kept getting the same results, and I couldn't understand. And I would ask God to do this, and I'd tell God to do that, and I would say, God, please do this, and he wouldn't do it. So here, I'm mad at God, I'm mad at my husband, and I'm mad at the world. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I didn't mean to do that. It's not my fault. Favorite phrase. So on May the, May the 5th, 1997, I had been with this fifth husband for about 10 years. No, not quite. We'd been together since I was 40, but he was, um, at that time, I was 49 and a half. So... Yeah, the Ryle was 10 years. He um, had enough. He finally had enough. And so we went to a Cinco de Mayo party, and I got polluted. And I went home, and I started my same regular routine, start a fight with him so he would get drunk and go to bed, and I could drink up what was left in the house and pass out. That was my regular routine. And I started it. And he started up the stairs at the house, and he looked at me, and he goes, Brenda, we've been together for 10 years. And you have never, ever, ever told me you were wrong. You have never apologized to me for anything. And I remember sitting on that couch, and I remember thinking, that might be true, but you've done worse than me, so I don't have to tell you I'm sorry. And I just looked at him. And he went on upstairs, and I kept drinking. And uh, I guess about an hour later, we were getting pretty low on booze in the house. And I went and woke him up because I wanted him to go get some more. <laughs> and I needed somebody to drive me because I couldn't drive. And I knew it. At least I was smart enough to know that. And uh, when I woke him up, he got angry. And he slammed out the door and he says, I'm never coming back. And that was horrific for me. I couldn't imagine that. Because, see, I was always the one that left. They always had to want me. I'm the one that would walk out the door. I had a sense that I knew when they were getting ready to throw me out, and I would throw them out first. But this one didn't do that. He walked out. And um, I sat in that house from May the, May the 5th to May the 13th. 
And I went out to get booze, came back in, locked the door, turned the blinds down, turned the stereo up. And I would hear the machine, the answering machine. We didn't have cell phones then. <laughs> we had answering machines. And somebody would call me, and I would say, I'll let the machine get it, and if I want to talk to him, I'll talk to him. Nobody called me that I wanted to talk to. I didn't answer that phone. People knocked on my door, and I didn't go to the door. I would peek out the blind and say, oh, I don't want to talk to them. I would, and, and I was hiding in that house, and I was drinking and drinking and steady drinking. Then on May the 13th, that morning, I stood up in the middle of my living room. I can't say morning. It was about 12.30 in the afternoon. Because, see, I always claimed I wasn't an alcoholic because I didn't drink in the morning. And I never thought about the fact that I didn't get up when it was morning. Um, so what happened, I stood there and I said, God, help me. And I didn't tell God what to do. First time I had ever, ever asked God for anything that I didn't tell him what to do because I knew what should be done. I had the answers. I had the answers till that day. And I had no answer. And I remember sitting on the couch and saying, same old thing. Nothing's going to happen for me. Not for me. You know. And I picked up the phone and I started making phone calls to all the hospitals. And I had my insurance card. And I couldn't read my card well enough for them to understand that I had insurance and I could get in. And they all kept saying, I can't help you. I can't help you. And I'm crying. And I, they can't help me. And finally, the last number that I could call was Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm living in Kissimmee, Florida. I'm living at Disney World. There's a bar on every corner. This is the ideal place to be. I'm an hour from the Pacific Ocean. I'm an hour, I mean, not Pacific, but the Gulf. I'm an hour from the Atlantic. I got everything anybody could want in my life, but I was miserable and I was dying inside. Finally, I got, I called Alcoholics Anonymous and I got this girl on the phone and she sounded like she was about 18, 19 years old. And I said, um, you don't understand. Famous last words. You don't understand. And she said, what don't I understand? I said, well, you're probably doing community service. I know you haven't been around long enough to know what it's like to not be able to quit drinking. And she said, oh, really? She said, I'll have you know. She said, I drank for 20 years, and I've been sober for five. How long have you been sober? And I wasn't sober then. And I said, maybe she does know. And I started talking to her. And she said, there's a club right around the corner from your house. They have three meetings a day. And my suggestion is you get ready and you go over there right now. The next meeting is at 530. You've already missed the name. And I said, well, yeah, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Why do I need to go now? And she said something that has always stuck with me. She said, if you stay in that house and wait for the 530 meeting, you're going to be drinking. And if you do, you won't go to that meeting. And she was right. I got up and I got dressed and I went to that clubhouse. And I walked in and they have a coffee bar in the back. And there was this old man behind the coffee bar. looked like he was 108. And, uh, you know, I'm still young, you know. I'm still young. I'm 50 years old. <laughs> and so I sit down, and, and I'm wondering, yeah, just what I'm doing there. I had no clue what I'm doing there. And he took one look at me, and he goes, you're new. And I'm like, well, how does he know? So he puts a cup of coffee in front of me. Now, I don't drink coffee. But he just he was such an old grump that I figured I better try, or he was going to hit me or something. I didn't know what to do. So uh, I sat at the high counter, and I had that cup of coffee, and I took a few sips, and it was horrible. I don't know if anybody notices how horrible AA coffee is, <laughs> but it, and it, it is to me anyway. But anyway, I, I sat there with that cup of coffee, and I was scared to get up. I was afraid if I tried to leave, because he started talking to me. I didn't hear anything he was saying. I just heard his tone, and he had this really gruff tone. And um, he started asking me questions, and I'm just like a deer in the headlights. I couldn't say a word, not a word. So he um, he says, well, you just sit here and wait. And I had two and a half hours to go to get to that meeting. I'm like, holy cow, what am I going to do? So I sat there with that cold cup of coffee <laughs> for two and a half hours, and I walked into that meeting. And when I did, they had a podium like this. And I thought, oh, we're going to, somebody's going to teach me something. So I sat down as far as I could get from that podium. And when I sat down, what happened was I wasn't hearing anything that was said. They started talking to me, and I didn't understand a word they were saying because they were using words that was not in my vocabulary. They were using words like sponsor, surrender, steps, 
that big book. What are they talking about? I didn't know. And I'm sitting there holding my purse, and I said, you know what? This thing only lasts an hour. I don't want to walk through these people to get out. So I'll sit here for an hour, and then I'll get out of here, and I'll go get, get to the liquor store in time to get another 12-pack. I still had some at home. I figured that would get me through the night. And uh, I got up at the end of the meeting, and I put my purse over my arm, and I'm walking to the door, and this girl says, oh, wait a minute. we got to pray. And I said, pray for what? And she said, well, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And I thought, oh, whatever it takes to get out of here. And um, we started saying the Lord's Prayer. And you know what? I used to say this all the time as a kid, and I could not remember the words. I did not know the words to the Lord's Prayer. I'm like, holy crap. Am I that far removed from reality? And then I probably forgot I said that. And uh, I grabbed my purse, and I'm heading for the door as soon as I let go of my hands. And this little blonde that had been sitting across from me in the meeting, she's all dressed up with makeup and, and, and nice clothes. And I'm thinking, not for me. And she grabs me, and she says, excuse me, is this your first meeting? And I'm like, yes. She says, do you want to talk? And my head's going, oh, hell no. <laughs> And I said yes. I don't know why, but I did. I know today. I didn't know then. We sat down at a table. Two other girls came over with us. And uh, they started talking about this thing called a big book. So she goes over and she picked up a white chip. And she says, I noticed you didn't get this. Hang on to it. And I said, okay. What's it supposed to do? I didn't know. And then she hands me a book. And she says, you're not capable of reading this right now. But let me tell you something. She said, the answer to every problem in your life is in that book, if you read it and apply it. Since you can't figure it out, you might need somebody who's done it before you to show you. I said, okay. Didn't open it. I took it with me. They wound up, make a long story short, they wound up getting me into a detox that night. And it was I was there from uh, May the 13th till May the 19th. And the minute we got there, this doctor checked me over, and the first thing he did was knock me out. Because, see, I've been drinking for 33 years, daily for the last 20. And my body was so addicted to alcohol on the physical level, not to mention my mind and my soul, you know, that I was on the verge of having a stroke or DTs or something because I've been off of alcohol for almost 24 hours, and I was starting to do shake and bake, and I was running a fever, and I was sweating, and, so the first thing they did was knock me out, and they had to medically remove alcohol from my system and bring me back around. And that took about three and a half days before I really came to and knew where I was or what I was doing. And um, I stayed there, and I got out on the 19th, and they, the psychiatrist there told me, she said, you need some further help. And I said, I can't afford it. And she said, well, what are you going to do? You've got to have a plan of action. And I said, I'm going back to AA. And she was giving me this really disgusted look. <laughs> she said, that is a good plan, but you need to put something with it. And I went, no. So she said, well, let me tell you something. She said, the quicker you get to a meeting when you leave here, the more you ensure your success. And I remembered that. And I got out of there at 9 o'clock in the morning, and I was sitting in the noon meeting at that same place where I'd gone before at noon, and I stayed there. And I took another week off from work. And I stayed there every single day because they opened at 10 o'clock in the morning and they closed at 10 o'clock at night. And I was at every meeting that they had. And I still didn't know what you guys were saying, but when I sat in that meeting, I felt safe. When I sat in that meeting, I didn't think I was going to drink. They told me to get a sponsor. I found a lady there that kept talking about being happy, joyous, and free. They didn't tell me what to get a sponsor with. They didn't tell me what I was going to do. And they didn't tell me any requirements. They just said get a sponsor. So what I did, I found that lady, and I really, really am blessed because this lady that I got had worked the 12 steps. She had a sponsor. She was in the tradition. She was in the concept. She was active in service, and she insisted that I follow her everywhere so I could learn all these aspects of Alcoholics Anonymous. She said, you've got to get right in the middle. And I said, well, I'm at every meeting. She said, that's not enough. And so she became... Not just my sponsor, she's my mentor, she's my spiritual guide. She was everything that, that I needed at that point. Because, see, I forgot about that prayer. Remember that day I told you on, on May the 13th when I stood in my living room and I said, God, help me? 
I didn't tell God what to do. I left it up to him. And when I left it up to him, miraculous things started happening. So she took me into this book, and, and just one of the biggest things that she taught me was that so the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. I don't want no spiritual experience. I just want to quit drinking. But she said I had to read it. So I did. And it says the central fact of our life today is the absolute certainty that our Creator has entered into our hearts and lives in a way that's indeed miraculous. He has committed to accomplish those things for us which we can never do for ourselves. I'm saying, oh, God, now they're going to put me in church. That's not what she was saying. What she was saying is I have to find a power greater than me. I couldn't use a, a doorknob, and I couldn't use a light bulb, because I can break those things. I'm good at breaking stuff. I've been breaking stuff all my life. I had to find something greater than me. And I did use the group, because it was a group. I couldn't use one person, because any, at any time somebody might fall out. I needed something strong. When the group stayed together, it showed me it was possible. There was people in that group that never went out. People in that group that never picked up again. That showed me it was possible. And um, I said, well, you know, okay, this is all fine and good, but now what do I do? And she said, do you realize what's going to happen if you don't follow through with these steps? And I said, no. She said, if you're seriously as alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle-of-the-road solution. We're in a position where life is becoming impossible. We've passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid. Wow. Human aid. I can't depend on another human being. I, you can't keep me sober. I can be locked up, which I needed to be quite a while. Uh, and, and I was. That helped take the alcohol out from me so that I could hear what I needed to hear. And it tells me that, you know, no human aid is going to be able to do this for me. It says, I only have two alternatives. One is to go to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, which means I'm going to keep drinking. I'm going to be just as miserable as I was that day I walked into AA, and I'm going to pray to die until I get enough guts to do it myself. You know, the other is to accept spiritual help. Spiritual help. This whole book talks about that all the way through. Then they tell me I have this disease. I have an obsession of the mind, which is thought process that does not respond to reason, and it is stronger than reason. Therefore, if I start thinking about a drink and it turns into an obsession, I'm going to go get it no matter what. Bottom line, no matter what. Left to my own devices, that's what I do. I've also got a physical allergy. The minute I pick that first drink up and I put it in my body, this allergy takes over. And when that does, I'm going to drink until I can't drink anymore. I'm going to either pass out, or I just really can't get to any. I might be locked up. <laughs> but, you know, I am going to drink as long as I can drink. Go out for a few beers? I've never had a few beers in my life. Not from the time I was 16. I always got drunk. So, okay, now I get the physical allergy part. And then I have, when I have the mental obsession coupled with the spiritual allergy, what I, ha I mean, the physical allergy, what I have is spiritual malady. Because, see, when I've got all that crap in me, there's no place in me for a spiritual solution. None whatsoever. So in order for me to find a spiritual solution, I can't drink. I need to be reaching something else. It tells me I need something with depth and weight because, you know, many times I said I was going to quit and I never stayed quit. I couldn't. I couldn't. So I had to get into this book and I had to get into these steps. And this lady was kind enough to take that journey with me. She called it walking the spiritual 12 steps of Alcock's mom. And I love that because that's exactly what happened to me. I started working these steps. I didn't do it perfect. I was one of these stubborn ones. Because, see, I really thought I was going to stick around for a while, not drink, and then yeah, sick husband was going to come back, and we're going to go off into the sunset, and I'm going to have a cocktail and be okay. This is what I believe. So I'm giving it lip service. She's telling me this stuff, and I'm, I'm hearing it, but I'm not wanting to hear it. And I'm just going to do this until I can get this man back. Well, what happened was he did come back at nine months, and he did want to get back together. And by that time, all the stuff that you guys had taught me was sinking in on me. It was, I was starting to understand what I was doing there and why I was there, because I don't have any power. Lack of power is my dilemma, and I wanted some power. And the only way I can get that power is through a spiritual experience. I can only do that that way. So when he come back and he wanted to come, I knew that if I went with him, I knew I'd be drunk that night. I keep remembering that first day I got out of prison. You know, 
I was drunk by noon, and I was doing other stuff I fixed. It was that simple for me. So um, I said no, and I hit that place where I was either going to do the work or I was going to go get drunk again. And I knew it. And I knew it. And I didn't know which one I was going to do. I really didn't know. But then my, you know, I called my sponsor and I said, look, I don't know what to do here. And she said, come over here and let's get busy. So we went back and redid one, two, and three. Because, see, I wouldn't do four and five. I wouldn't do it because I didn't plan on sticking around. I wouldn't do it because then you're going to know me. And you're going to know what a failure I think I am. You're going to know all those words about me that I don't want anybody to know, the things that I've been hiding for 33 years. And I didn't want you to know that. But then I got scared enough of drinking again, and I got willing. I actually got willing to write it down. I actually got willing to tell her about it. And I, was, I had some things I was never going to tell. I'll take them to my grave. And she took me off guard because she said, okay, tell me the worst thing you ever did. And I didn't think about it. I blurted it out. I've been talking to her for a long time. I just spit it out. And she goes, now we can get down to the rest of it. And we did and I did the work. See, four and five is about me. I got honest with another human being. She knew all about me, and she didn't leave me. She didn't throw me away. She didn't tell me I was no good. Well, see, that's what I would have done to me. That's exactly what I would have done to me. And um, she didn't do that. So we, set, we kept going on this journey. And six and seven was about me building and expanding that belief in a higher power. It's about me learning how to do this with a higher power and asking this higher power to join me in this life, you know. Show me what you want me to do. Show me what you want me to learn. Show me what I need to know to live life successfully. That doesn't mean I make a lot of money. It means just being able to get up in the day and get through the day without a drink. For me, that's what it was. You know, I can hold a job now. I don't get, I don't get sent home because I got alcohol on my breath, you know. Uh, so then I, when I do eight and nine and I'm making those amends to you, you know, you get a benefit of me making amends, but you know, I'm the one that gets a real benefit. Because now I can walk down the street and I'm not expecting somebody to come up and jump me from behind. I'm not expecting somebody to come up and yell and scream at me because, see, I set right those wrongs I did with you. And I do this on a regular basis. And, with, you know, with 10, 11, and 12, they call them maintenance steps. That's not what I was taught. I was taught they were my growth steps. Because if I don't do 10, 11, and 12 on a regular basis, I'm not going to be coming at my challenges today in the way I need to. Because every day is about change. My whole life is about you. I'm not a baby anymore. I'm a 65-year-old woman. Man, if that's not changed, I don't know what is. You know? So I've got to be able to look at things in a different way. I've got to be able to know where I stand with my God and with my fellows. And so four and five is all about me, learning about me. Six and seven is about taking this walk with God. Eight and nine is about setting right the things I did with you. And anything I do with you, as long as I have God in the middle, is going to be a success in every single way. Even if I don't see it, it will end up being a success. So anyway, I moved here. Well, before I moved here, what happened was I went at eight years sober to the doctor. And this is some of the stuff Todd was referring to. Uh, when I was um, three years sober, I found out I had cancer. I had surgery. Um, I didn't have to do anything major for it. They took care of it through surgery. I was out of work four months. Then in 2005, they wound up taking this half of my face off for another type of cancer. I had to go through rebuilding it, which took nine surgeries. And uh, it took me being allergic to the antibiotics that they were giving me and winding up in the hospital uh, for a month uh, with bacterial colitis. I thought that was it. I thought I was good to go. At eight years sober, I found out that all that dope that I shot gave me hepatitis C. Now... With hepatitis C, it eats the liver up real quick. And when they finally found out that I had liver damage, I was at the place where they told me it was either a transplant or not. I'm an alcoholic, guys. You know, are they going to give an alcoholic a liver? Well, the place I went said yes. I couldn't, you know, I hadn't had a drink in eight years. They talked to me. They worked with me. And then they tested me, and they told me I couldn't get it. <laughs> so uh, I said, okay. And I went home. And I was mad. I'm mad at God all over again. So they called me and told me to come back and be tested again. And I said, okay. And I, I went back again. And they told me no again. And I went home and me and God had a big fight. I mean a big fight. Because I had a concrete den in my house. And I'm out there beating the walls. Nobody's around. Because, see, 
I have this persona. Even then, my ego is up there. And I thought, I didn't take care of it in the 12 steps. It went down when I got here. It keeps coming back. So what I had to do was let you think I'm okay. I'm eight years sober. I'm fine, right? So you would come up and ask me how the tests went. I would tell you. I said, you poor thing, are you okay? I'm good. I'm fine. I'm okay. God's doing it. And I went home and got in this big fight with God. And I'm hitting the wall and I'm screaming and I'm cussing. And I'm, you know, drinking did not occur to me. Ringing somebody's neck did. But, you know, I, I got in this big fight. And um, it went on for a while. And finally I sat down in my rocking chair and I'd been crying so long and so hard. I was having to take deep breaths to try to stop. And you know how you get the hiccups after you cried that long? And that's where I was at. And all of a sudden this voice comes in my head. It wasn't, it wasn't me. Only thing I can tell you today, this is my experience, I do believe it was God telling me. And he says, Brenda, God didn't do this to you. You did it yourself by the choices you made. Holy crap. Holy crap. Now i got to turn around and say it's okay to die. I don't want to do that either. But you know what? When I said that, this peace came over me, and I felt so at ease with everything. That I was perfectly okay with what was going on. And I lay, I sat in that chair, and I was just rocking. And uh, I guess I sat there about ten minutes. And for the first time in my life, I was at complete peace and ease with me and everything around me. And then my phone rang. Disturbed me. I didn't like that. I went to the phone, and it was the hospital saying, can you come back up one more time? And I said, okay. It's going to be more of the same. So I went back up to Gainesville, Florida, and I went in, and, and they said no again. So I came home, and they told me to start getting my affairs in order. So I went to Social Security with a letter from the hospital that I had about three months to live. And I gave it to the guy. The poor guy liked to sell out. He was scared to death of me. He thought I was going to pass out on him right there. But he told me that, you know, I could get the disability. My girlfriend was with me. He says, well, we're going to take care of you on this. We've got you on Medicare. We've got you on Medicaid. Uh, you've got the Social Security disability. Just like that. I hear tales of people having to do that, taking five, six, seven years. I'm like, wow, all I get to do is die. <laughs> you know? So uh, I was fine with that. You know, I went home, and I'm, I was still at peace. So I called the hospital. I called my coordinator, and I said, look, I did what you told me to. I went to Social Security. And she said, well, Brenda, she said, I've got some news for you. And I said, what? She says, they put you on the list. And I went, really? She said, yeah, but it takes about a year and you got three months. She says, you're on the list, but don't count on it. I said, okay. And I was fine with that. Seven weeks later, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call that says, do you want your new liver? I took off for the hospital. And I was up there in that hospital for two months. I almost didn't make it through the surgery. But you know what? I wasn't, I wasn't scared. I wasn't worried. Because, see, for the first time in my life, I'm not in charge. First time, even in my eight years of sobriety, I'm not in charge. Wow. How easy is that? It's hard to do, trust me. But it makes living so much easier. So I did get, I got the liver. I came to North Carolina to take care of my father. I got to spend the last year of his life with him, which is amazing. I lost my mother while I was still drinking. So I got to spend the last year of my father's life with him. And I got to build a life here in North Carolina and meet some absolutely wonderful people. I still go back to Florida every three months. I'm leaving this June 1st. I'll be there for a month for medical tests and all that stuff because it's that same rigmarole that you got to do in order to get the transplant. The, um, the other option is not advisable for me. <laughs> I don't want to do that because, you know, if I don't go take care of this, then I'm not doing what I was told to do, which I've got to take care of myself mentally, spiritually, and physically. These are the three points of Alcoholics Anonymous. We have a triangle that has three points. One is for unity, one is for service, one is for recovery. I have to do all three. It's heart, body, and soul. And it's that simple. And as long as I do that, my life stays wonderful. The minute I forget to do that, it goes down in a hurry. Trust me, it goes down really quick. And what I found is I like the results I get when I do what I'm supposed to do. And since I like those results, I have to keep doing them because I know what, I know what happens when I don't. Um, I've been sober 16 years, celebrated last week. And uh, for this old lady, that's a miracle. For the first time in my life, I'm actually living. 
I didn't marry a 24-year-old in the last 16 years. Um, as a matter of fact, I didn't marry anybody in the last 16 years because I'm still learning what's wrong with me. It's a lifetime job. Trust me. But you know what? The joy is in the journey, and it makes it absolutely wonderful. When I get up in the morning and I see the sun or I see the rain, it's fine. I'm going to enjoy this day because this is the day the good Lord gave me, and I will enjoy it. I'm not going to throw away another day because I threw away many, many years. So every day is the day that I give thanks for just being here. Thank you for letting me come and letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.